Hello, everybody. I'm assuming most of y'all are here for the lock picking class. My name is Aiden Crenshaw, and because of the weird way we have everything lined up here, I'm probably going to be sitting down for most of the class. But we're going to teach you a little bit about lock picking and bypass today. First of all, a little bit about me. My name is Adrian Crenshaw. I run IronGeek.com. Has anybody been to the website before? Awesome. Thank you much. Uh, I do various things. Uh, I'm interested in InfoSec education, so I put out a lot of free educational material. And I don't know everything. I'm just getting time on my hands. I will likely get some things wrong. And if I do, come up afterwards and tell me. And I'm also a senior information security consultant at TrustSec and co-founder of Debicon. Now, i got to give a few thanks to some people who helped influence uh, this particular class. Dossman is my uh, lock mentor. He's a black badge, black badge winner at DEF CON for how good lock picking he is. He doesn't think he's particularly good, but he's better than most people I know. And he runs Boom Controls, and he did Lockpick Village here last year, but he couldn't make it this year. He's also working on a book, which I haven't seen yet, but I'm sure it's be pretty good. Deviant Olaf, and don't ask me how two L's makes an Olaf, but uh, is another guy. He wrote, wrote a great book called Practical Guide to Lock Picking. He has a more advanced one, which I don't think I have yet, which is a great primer on lock picking if you want to understand it at a deeper level. Um, Shane Lawson was his technical editor. And he's done a lot of work on things. He did a presentation a few cons ago about decoding, I believe it was the Schlage um, answer to the quick set smart key resetter. Ba uh, smart key, a uh, resettable key. Basically, you could take a flag, move it inside the lock, and be able to count the number of notches and figure out what key to use in that. You could basically get reproduced by number. Doug uh, Highweller and Jeff Moss, two guys out of Cleveland Lock Sporter who I learned a lot of stuff from, and I get locks from them. And uh, Skylar Town. If you get to see one of Skylar Town's talks, it's kind of interesting. He talks about locks the way a man might talk about his wife, assuming he likes his wife. The dude is hugely into locks. And he's doing research into the history of you know, how this lock came from here and how this lock came from here and what was the first lock that used this particular mechanism. But you know, if you like that kind of history, he's a fascinating guy to listen to. And he's also a champion lock picker. All right, what is lock picking? Gosh, I've never favor for somebody. Can anybody get me a glass of water? Oh, I appreciate it, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what is lock picking? It's using imperfections in the lock to be able to get into it without using the proper key. Uh, breaking and entering is generally an easier thing to do, but um, laws are going to vary from state to state as far as whether or not you can possess these. So, how do you put this way? Um, I'll get to look at that a little bit in the ethics, but people ask, why do you teach how to lock pick? Well, I have several reasons for doing it, but um, generally speaking, <sighs> It's not as useful to a burglar as you might think, because most of them are going to go through um, a window. And the question I get a lot is, um, what locks do I use in my front door? Well, because of the whole window factor, I have an El Cheapo quick set on my front door, because why bother? And as someone pointed out to me recently at a dinner, if you have like a very expensive medical lock on your front door, people must be going, huh, what's he trying to protect? So it's like, okay, you have windows and a really expensive lock. We'll just go through the windows. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Let's try I'm glad you didn't switch it up with Everclear. All right. Well, also we're also talking about lock bypass in this class. Uh, lock bypass is passing. You're not actually picking at the lock's pins or mechanisms directly. Usually, you're um, doing it some other way. Uh, shimming would be one example. And I'm going to show that a little bit later. Shimming, it's a different thing. Bypass drivers, loading, counts name from celluloid or credit carding a lock. All these things are different methods to bypass a lock. And of course, the Slim Jim, which I don't have a car in here, so I can't demo. Now, as for legality, it varies from state to state. Here in Ohio, possession of picks can be... Well, not Ohio. Why am I thinking I'm in Ohio for some reason? I've gone to a lot of cons over the last couple of weeks. Um, sorry. Here in Indiana, picks are legal by statute. The state must prove criminal intent. Essentially, if you have lock picks here, it may be an extra charge of your cart burglary where you have them, but having them in and of itself is not illegal. There are a few states where it's prima facie evidence. Basically, they, they see you have it. You better have an excuse for having it. Otherwise, it's assumed that you're more than to commit um, a crime. 
and a few states have it outright banned. Like, um, in theory, well, banned for certain people. For instance, in Tennessee, in theory, you have to be a licensed locksmith to actually have them. Though we pick locks at Tennessee Hacker Cons all the time, no one bothers us. Basically, it's there, and I am not a lawyer, but my, my say it's basically there to protect the um, locksmiths that are already there, and you have to join. I don't know if it's a union exactly, but it's kind of a protectionist thing, as I understand it. Also, various states have different laws about whether or not you can possess them versus sell them. Like my understanding, I've been told it's illegal to sell in Illinois, but you can possess them. I don't know if that's true or not. Somebody else told me that in California you can sell them, but you have to take the name down of everybody who gets them from you. Again, this is just what I'm told. Uh, Tool has some interesting stuff out there, uh, but they have a website that covers laws of the various states. Some of the things I just said were hearsay, but I check out this stuff because um, I think they spent like $5,000 in lawyers' fees to research lock laws. All right, as far as where I carry my sna my uh, snakes, yeah. where I carry my picks, I carry pretty much everywhere. I'm on the plane with that stuff. I'm on the plane with this stuff. Debbie and Olive and I travel with picks all the time on the plane, no problems. Occasionally you hear someone getting having an issue with it. I mean, I've had um, uh, I've had wire strippers confiscated, more or less. I could have gone check them. I've had a uh, same thing happen with um, soldering irons, but they let me free with all this stuff. The one time a TSA question, I had a single cuff for demonstration purposes. It wasn't handcuffs. It was a single cuff. You could lock one arm. That's it. And she held it and like, she would act as supervisor. Is he allowed to have this in the plane? What the hell am I going to do? <laughs> I wasn't sure I was going to do with the wire strippers either. But oh, your, your miles may vary. If you want to hear a story about someone who did get in, in some, you know, pro has had some problems because of lock picks, you can check out uh, some information from, um, from Laws Consulting. Uh, Chris Nickerson apparently had a little bit of a kerfuffle on the plane. Those in the class, by the way, I'm going to um, pull out some lock picks so we can eventually start picking some locks. And I thought we were originally doing this class downstairs, but it kind of decided, partly by me, just to do it up here because we already have locks here. So we can find some locks there. Whatever lock table you find the lock on, try to put it back on that table because some of these are mine, some of these are Justin's and Scott's. So we'll distribute a few of these out there. Oh, actually, that one security one I'm going to need later on for a demo. Thank you. I'll see if I can get a few more out there. I grabbed some of the easier ones for um, practice for the class, but now I need to distribute them back out again. That should be most of those. And... I may tell you to go s come to a certain table to grab some picks. We'll just use this as our central table. And you see me using a technique. Try to find a similar pick in here as a tension tool, and uh, you can try to replicate it. I wanted to bring some picks here to sell. Unfortunately, um, I sold out at my last conference. However, Justin and Scott. Oh, I couldn't make it. Oh, well, I guess we don't have um, ones to sell, so <laughs> feel free to play with those loners. Next up, ethics of lock picking. Uh, why teach this, people ask? Well, first of all, criminals will generally break in a window anyway, so they're not going to really be using lock picking skills. A pen tester, though, might, because generally your client's not going to want you to break a window to be able to get in and steal a computer. Don't be frowned upon. Also, it just looks impressive. Also, I just think locks in general are kind of cool mechanisms. Understanding how they work, how the mechanics work, is, I think, fascinating. You can get a good idea also from just playing with locks, understanding what a good lock is, what to look for when you go to a hardware store that makes something a lock that's a little bit more secure than like putting a shed or your front door. But like I said, usually people are going to go through other methods, breaking and injuring. Tool has two main warnings they give. One, Tool, by the way, is the order of... I don't remember all the L's, Locksport. Um, big Locksport uh, organization. They set up uh, these kind of villages at a lot of other conferences. Their two main rules are don't pick a lock that does not belong to you or you do not have permission from the rightful owner. And don't pick a lock that you rely on. 
there's sometimes you can break a lock. I have not done it myself too often. And it's usually from a lot of picking, and it's usually a very cheap lock. But if you really rely on a lock, you generally don't want to pick it, especially with comb picks, because someone busted a comb pick off in one of my locks. I had to try to remove that today. Uh, any lock you really rely on, you might want to yeah skip the picking on it. Though that said, yes, I picked my front door lock before that kind of thing. We're gonna go over the basics of some of the components of a lock. And I realize I'm in some of people's way, so I'm actually gonna sit down at this point and we will continue from there. Now a few of the parts I'll point out are the shackle. You can see my mouse pointer at all. The locking lip lever or a prowl or dog. I've seen different names for this. Some don't actually have these ones, these uh, locking prowls that have springs on them. What they have is just ball bearings that fall the way. Just a tip, the ball bearings are far more secure. I'm going to show a technique later on called shimming that will allow you to get into one that's like this. But ball bearings, there's nowhere for the ball bearing to go, so you can't shim a ball bearing lock. Here's the actuator and the driver. And here we have the cylinder. And the cylinder is the main core part of the lock. It has the pins and the tumblers on it, we're going to talk about here in a bit. A little bit more terminology. These holes are the chambers. These holes are the chambers where the pin stacks go into. And the pin stacks are composed of three parts. You have the spring itself, the driver pin, and the key pin. And the core idea behind locks is when you have very fine lines up at the shear line, this plug can spin in the cylinder. And I will actually demonstrate that right now, and let's hope this video holds out. Go get some of my demo stuff out of my pocket. Oh, that tool gave me that. I need to put that up someplace. We'll get out some practice locks here to demonstrate. Remember I mentioned everything where it lines up the shear line, you can turn the cylinder. So here's to give you an example. I'm not actually sure to pick this one right now. I'm just going to lift all the pins up above the cylinder. Uh, I should say up above the plug. And you can see the springs at the top, the driver pins, and the key pins. If I put in the wrong key, they don't line up the shear line, I can't turn anything. You see how some of the key pins are in the way? If I put in the right key, everything lines up and you can turn it. So I don't have two sets of keys for this, I don't think. Uh, I kind of sort of do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass this one around and just kind of um, look at it, look at how the pin stack works, put in the wrong key, look how it works, and just pass it around. So just take it around this table, and then that table, and that table, and so forth. Just make sure it gets back to me eventually. True for these, these locks are not good at all for practicing, but they're great for illustrating how one of these locks works. I'm going to uh, do some more demoing that in a bit. Now, where do you want to go ahead and get cheap picks and tools? Several sources. I have some stuff that's like cheap Chinese sets. Still, on some of these is of questionable quality. Uh, the value on some things. I mean, I have some lock picks from China that are, seem to be designed specifically for certain types of Chinese locks. But you can get some cheap sets, and not all of it's bad. HackerCons is usually a good source. A tool, whenever they set up some place, they usually have lock picks for sale. Fools does also. I do sometimes. I just happen to run out of everything. Actually, I have uh, warded lock picks, and I do have these little jackknife sets, but that's pretty much all I've got left. Um, South Ward is a company that makes a lot of lock picks. It's decent quality stuff. It's probably not my favorite company, but it's they have decent stuff. Uh, most of the stuff I get is from Southern Specialties, just because I can get that at wholesale, and it's decent. Uh, better quality still, though, you're finding stuff like Sparrows picks. Sparrows makes theirs out of. I don't remember. I was told once before what type of. Um, I want to say it's. Um, 420 full hard or 302 full hard. If you opt to the webpage or take what kind of steel, they're all a little bit tougher. I've bit some specialty picks, but these would be much harder to pick. I said much harder to bend. If I was pick 
back to what we're talking about, there's your basic hook. Hooks are for usually single pin picking, where you individually try to manipulate each pin, pin stack and lift just the key pin above the shear, shear line. Di half diamonds are used for a bunch of things. You can use them for single pin picking. A lot of people use them as rakes. Some people use the back side of them to count how many pins are in the lock by holding it upside down, pulling it through, and here, tap, tap, tap. The deforest offset, I used mine for raking, and usually you can get a very slim profile on So for small locks, they're really good to get into those. And the auto timing, yeah. An L rake, I've also heard these referred to as a city rake. I've also heard them referred to as a comb rake, which is a really bad name because a comb can mean something else. These are usually used for raking where you just put them in the lock and you scrub them across the pins gently. And hopefully you get the pins in such a state that you can open the lock. Oh, there's also things like bogotas or wave rakes. The reason I put them down is two different um, things. Technically, it's probably not a bogota unless it's something like this. A bogota is meant to be used where you use one tool as your tension tool while you use the other one as your pick. So the idea is you'd have one in your lock, and I didn't get me. Sounds falling out. You can get me a lock. So the idea is you'd have one used as your tension tool. Remember I mentioned imperfections in the lock? We'll go cover a lot more of this in a second. But those pin stacks are not perfectly drilled. There's going to be imperfections where someone can hopefully get a tool in and open the lock by um, getting individual pin stacks just to drive a pin to lock them above the shear line. And we're going to give a picture of that in a second. Let me try this a little differently. Yeah, but this is the core idea of Bogotas is just to have two tools and be able to open the lock. And the original ones of, of the original type of Bogota was made by a guy named Umbundo. Uh He made using a, a street sweep of bristles, and the mount, the shape of the uh, triple hump reminded him of the mountains of Bogota, Colombia. <coughs> You can make them out of things like windshield wiper blades, using a general tool, or I took a couple of old tension tools and made some on my own. These can actually be really useful for getting into some places. Anyway, that's kind of a sideline of why it's a Bogota versus a rave rake. A rave rake would be something like, um, well, something more like this, which has a traditional pick handle, but you can't use it as a tension tool. There's several things you can do to improve a set of picks once you get them from the manufacturer. One, if they didn't come with handles, you can put a quarter inch heat shrink on them and maybe put like three layers. That usually makes a pretty good handle. Glass dip works great. Hot glue, I've tried to make my own hot glue handles before. Mixed luck, you can use, you can kind of mold that stuff, but may have mixed results. You can also um, try to do this to make them a little better, sand and polish them with a very fine grit. Not the handles, the, the ends of the pick itself, which is what I did to uh, the homemade set of Bogotas I made so they smoothly move in and out of the lock. Again, the idea behind the Bogota is you're rocking and you're moving in and out and you're trying to replicate a lot of possible key cuts. That brings you attention tools. There's all sorts of attention tools out there. Uh, most of the sets I've seen sold only use bottom of the key, bottom of the keyway tension tools where you put the tension tool as it seems from the name in the bottom of the keyway. There's also top of the keyway tension tools. Uh, Peterson makes some really good ones. If you want to make your own tension tools, windshield wiper blades are usually pretty good. Street sweeper bristles, uh, pop of hampers. But the point of tension tool is you have to make sure you get it in just the right spot in the lock. If you're doing things like, um, well, I'll give you an example. If you have a really bad tension tool, what you might end up doing is not being able to get a good central position in the lock. And what you'll do is you'll scrape along the cylinder down at the bottom. Like your catch. You see how that one's way down low and scraping the bottom? A better position would be if it got, if it stayed up a little higher and didn't quite scrape. And that's a very subtle difference which you may not see on camera. There's also top of the keyway tools that lock it at the top. The problem with those is that they fall out easy, but some locks you just can't open without top tensioning them. Well, maybe you can, but a lot more difficult. 
they make top tension tools also like this one. These, um, oh, let's see. I got some Peterson pry balls in here, and I have some uh, similar tools from Sparrows, and I can't always tell a difference without getting them out. Ah, like this is another type of top keyway tension tool. It's got little serrations, which probably aren't going to make it on camera, like right there. They help hold it in a little better. And you tension with it up the top like that. It's really easy for it to fall out, but some locks you just pretty much have the top tension. I carry more tension tools probably than anything else just because, well, if you don't have the back of tension tool, some locks are just way, way harder to get. And when it comes to using the tension tools, keep in mind, lock picking is not a brute force kind of thing. If your fingers are turning white from holding the tension tool, way too much tension. If you feel like you have to push the pick, too much pressure on the pick. Everything is a smooth motion. If it takes much strength at all, it's too much. And so to keep to get this idea across, to get this idea across, I use a parable my buddy Mick told me that his lock pick instructor told him. Pretend you have a pet ant, and you dearly love this ant, but this ant has poison all around it. And you don't want the ant to walk off from the poison and die, but you don't want to put so much pressure on him that you're going to kill him. So you don't want to crush him, so you just got to put just enough pressure on the little ant's head that he doesn't move, but he doesn't walk into the poison. So he doesn't walk into poison, but you don't crush him. And Mary Conley, by the way, made that artwork for me one day on a quick request. Like, I need some art for a, a talk I'm doing. And quickly made that one up for me. So that's Mick the Ant. I sent that artwork to him, and he got all confused, like, what are you saying about crushing me? I'm, I'm, I'm confused. He forgot about the whole incident he told me the story in. Anyway, for practice locks, there's a couple different ways people practice. I made a bunch of lock towers, and uh, that's one of the things I used to practicing on and what I take to lockpick villages. Um, some people like to use progressive uh, cylinder locks to practice on. We just have the cylinder. You individually pin pick them. That's what you, you got some of those over there, right, Justin? Some progressives, yeah. Yes. Uh, I've made some progressives that are built into padlocks so that you can practice on those. And, oh, that reminds me, I need to pull those out. Oh, I'll show those African locks off later on. A buddy of mine recently went to the Hackers for Charity uh, Center over at uh, Uganda, and uh, him and Johnny Long, Belt and Johnny Long sent me back a whole bunch of, or Belt came back with him, a bunch of uh, cool locks from Africa. Um, one set of locks I want to pull out here real quick. These are a set of progressives I designed that have one pin, two pin, three pin, four pin, so you can practice picking them. The other set's in the CTF challenge, but they're pretty hard to pick even if even if you have a little even if they've been repinned to only have one or two pins because of how they have to be tensioned. But I'm gonna put a few of these out for people to practice with and try and pass around. I shall pick a few off before I do that. And I'll use them as my demo. Uh, some people like to get these um, cutaways and transparent locks. Well, first of all, you're not going to be able to see the tumblers in a lot normally. And a trans one of these transparent locks is made out of uh, polycarbonate, acrylic, or whatever, like the one that was handing around. It really doesn't have the same feel as a normal lock. It doesn't just doesn't feel right. Um, so I don't recommend them for uh, practice. I wish more people. I wish actually someone mass produced these progressive padlocks. I had to go in and individually rekey them myself. There's something much more satisfying about opening a lock when it's a padlock and you hear the shackle go versus um, just a cylinder floating in your hand. But uh, some sources for these locks, though, if you want really cheap locks, go to a, a Habitat for Humanity. You'll be able to get old used door locks for like three bucks each. You won't have a key for it, but that's generally not a problem. At least if you want to learn about lock picking. And I have a tons of ones from old hardware from hardware stores. In case you have a locksmith that's closing down, you'll be able to get some uh, locks from them. There's tons of sources like that. Ask friends, do you, you have any old locks that you don't have the key for anymore? There's all sorts of sources. Me, I just slowly accumulated a ton of locks over the years from um, getting them from hardware stores and other sources and people just bringing me locks. Another one, this is a more controversial way to get locks, love locks. Anybody familiar with the tradition of love locks? Yeah, yeah it's kind of interesting. It's, uh, I think it was originally a Czech thing. But anyways, big in France. 
now. There's even a bridge in France where um, so, many, so many love locks that like a side of it fell off and now they're cleaning it all up. Um, the, the tradition is something along the lines of, you know, a couple takes a lock, maybe writes their name on it, locks it on the bridge to ensure their uh, undying love. But cities come through and cut these things off. There's a bridge in Louisville where they do this and uh, they, the locks end up disappearing anyway because the government cuts them off. So I go up there and go, free lock for the lock village. So if you see any locks in this village, if you see any locks in this village that have a little heart on them, and like, you know, Toby and Melissa, that's where those locks came from. All right, lock types. We're going to talk about all sorts of lock types in this class, but um, the main ones we're doing is pin tumbler. So we'll, let's first talk a little about warded locks. And then we'll go into pin tumblers. Then we'll talk about wafer locks and disc detainer. We're not going to cover a whole lot. All right, a warded lock is an incredible simple mechanism. Essentially, all one is is pieces of metal that keep you from turning any old thing like a screwdriver in it. See this right here? That's how a warded lock. The keys normally look something like this, though, in the warded locks you'll probably see around here in the United States. This is one from a master lock. On some of the really cheap uh, ones that are made by um, or that are distributed to through Walmart, the mountain security ones, you can actually take all the sides of the keys, grind it down except for the very tip, leave just the tip at a turning surface, and you'll pick any of the locks of that particular type. But like I'll give you an example here of one of the warded locks. Essentially you have a set of five different keys that can be used in these that will open up pretty much all warded locks. I call them keys. I meant to call them picks, but I might as well call them keys once you get an idea of how easily they work. Ward. A ward isn't something that stops. It's in a block. Like in, uh, in, in various martial arts, a ward might also be a block. Um, that's what it is. It's just something that, that, that blocks any old thing from being turned in there. However, that said, in a pin and tumbler lock, the shape of the keyway is often referred to as a ward also. So a lot of these terms get used multiple ways. Like how many, um, how many uses for the acronym MAC do you know from computers? I'll give you another one before this talk is done. Maximum adjacent cut. Basically, it, to make a key reliable, you can only have so big of a difference in key in pin depth, or the, the keys don't get stuck in there a whole lot. So there's a maximum decent cut. So the maximum theoretical possibility of number of potential key cuts that you can make is lower than what you'd mathematically think it was without a, accounting for maximum Jason cut. And now you have another Mac. Anyway, one of these tools will likely go into the lock and actually turn it. That's not the one. So I try one of the other of the five. I happen to be pretty sure it's this one because I've done this lock before. A few times. That's all it is. Real locks are incredibly simple, and usually one of these five tools will open one. And the keyway looks something like that if you look down it. Notice there's not any pins, you don't see anything flat laying down. Uh, that's just a warded lock. If you see one out there on the table, actually, people look at the, look on a table and see if you see a warded lock of some kind. You found one over there? Uh, yeah, that might be one. But that's all it takes to it. So I'm actually pass this around for you to get an idea how simple that is. You reach two in. And you don't do it all the way on this one. It doesn't move at all. So you have to pull it back a little bit. Feel for it. Feel springy. And then it opens. Make sure these get back to me at the end. Oh, by the way, where's the acrylic lock? It made it around? Okay, just keep it going around and... Eventually, whenever it's finished, just bring it up to my table. Do you want to try this? Just put it in the lock. Turn. And you got to feel for it to really slightly springy and then turn. And I might even have a better one to test on, but um, that one. Actually, these ones I've gotten open. This one is a little bit harder. Most water locks aren't, aren't as easy as all that, but that one, um, that one actually I do have some issue with. That's a very simple warded lock. Here's the warded lock fix I was mentioning before. Now, wafer locks are slightly different there, or I should say more than slightly. And I need to find what I did with my wafer lock. Ah, there it is. Wafer locks have these little wafers that drop down into a channel. When the proper key is inserted, you can turn you can turn the uh, lock because those wafers are pulled up out of the way. And I'll give you a demonstration of that here in a second. 
However, I may need the pro proper key for it, and uh, the proper key is still moving around with the acrylic lock. Actually, whoever currently has the acrylic lock, would you come up here for a second for me? Ah, <clears throat> oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Let me. You, you, you keep hold that there for a second, um, and I'll give. I'll hand this back to you in a second. All right, here is a wafer lock, and if you look at it, you have these little wafers hanging down. And you have these channels inside the body of this cylinder. When those wafers are out, you can't turn the lock. However, if you insert the proper key, it should pull up all those wafers and you can turn it. So this is it without being without being inside the cylinder. And oh let me align it right. You can see those wafers pop in and out. Now, wafer locks are used in a lot of applications where someone needs uh, like a cheap lock. You can find these in cabinets all the time. Usually, wafer locks are really easy to rake open. And uh, I'll demonstrate a little raking technique here in a bit. And if this hasn't gone all the way around, you can go grab it again. Thank you. With raking technique, essentially all you do is apply a little bit of um, tension, find yourself a tool that will fit into the lock well. I like something like a DeForest Offset Diamond, which you may not be able to quite make out on camera here. And I rake that through the lock and it just turned on me one, one spot. You may not have been able to see it, but um, I wouldn't lie to you about that. Let me see if I can get that to go again. So I get somebody that will lock into um, the Kiwi well, apply just a little bit of tension, then the mic, and I basically this, and it turned again. I, usually uh, raking, wait, I say raking weight for locks is um, pretty easy. Oh, right, I've also been on pen tests of sort where they had very good locks on everything, like things like Medicos and all that. Medico is a little bit more complicated than I can explain right here, but um, I'll try. Medico locks, they have pin tumblers that not only you have to get the right height, but you have to get the right angle that the pin has to be turned for the lock to open. They're incredibly hard to pick, but they had these kind of keys inside of a key box that had something that was the equivalent of this on it. So I picked this, and we could get to the other keys. Sometimes it's the easiest path. Pin tumble locks, what you're going to count them most probably, your front door lock is most likely a pin tumble lock unless you've got one of those um, newer uh, quick set smart keys. Those will seem to take off. But generally, your front door lock, I was guarantee is a pin tumble lock. Most of your padlocks will be pin tumble locks. It's just the most common lock you're going to find. Ooh, somebody bought me extra water. Thank you. Yeah, I have to really talk loud because you're on a PA system in here, so I'll get dry fast. Pin tumbler locks work by, as you see in that little illustration I passed around, lining everything up with that shear line, able to turn that plug in that cylinder, and there you go. You can oh, you can turn the cylinder, and whatever tailpiece is hooked to the back, well, work the mechanisms, pull back a bolt, pull back a latch, or whatever it needs to do to uh, open the door. The bottom one is just another illustration of that wafer lock and the wafers popping in and out depending on what key has been inserted. So that's a little bit more of it illustrating getting the proper key cuts in there, getting all the pins, all the key pins of the right size correlated with the proper cuts in a key and you'll be able to turn it. For instance, you see this key right here, it's almost the right key for this lock, but this pin is just slightly too long, and um, or I should say maybe this cut is slightly too deep, and so the driver pin gets in the way. This particular cut, it, it would need to be deeper, then this pin could fall far enough to where this particular driver pin is just at the shear line, and this key pin is just at the shear line, and you can turn it. It's just not quite there. You sometimes find people use something called, uh, called something called a tryout key. It's a set of keys that are 
replicate enough of the common key cuts you're going to see that one of them might work in a lock. And uh, sometimes just wiggling a key that's not quite the right key might work. Uh, have you ever seen an old uh, lock and key that where if you push the key all the way in, you can't turn it? But if you pull it out one notch, it will? That's because how the key wears. And by pulling out that little notch, you raise those pins just enough to be able to open the lock. Now, when you're picking a lock, what you're doing is usually, or pin temple lock that is, applying slice bit of tension. And the idea is, as you'll see here, you're creating a little ledge for that driver pin to lock up on top of, then you let the key pin fall back down, and you'll hopefully be able to open the lock. I'm going to try to illustrate that with a transparent padlock that I had here at one time, and now I'm not sure what I did with. I had so much stuff on this table, guys. All right, um, was anybody, oh, there it is. That's Johnny. All right. Let me put this back in my pocket. Get yeah, on. All right. I'm going to try to illustrate a little single pin picking here. Here I have a transparent padlock. You can see we have the springs, the drive pins, and the key pins. Well, you can't see the key pins right now, but you will if I lift them up for you to see. Don't quite make it out well, but you see them down at the bottom. You want to apply very light tension, and here's the main reason for light tension. If you apply too much tension, it's real easy to get these key pins overdriven and have them locked up in the shear line. Like, I'll give you a demonstration. I have too much tension on this, and I pecked it anyway. Um, all right. Too much tension, and you can get something like that. If you see the second one in, I have a key pin that's locked up above the shear line, like stuck in the shear line by pure force. And that's not what you want. You won't be able to turn it then. You see people that lock up those and go, well, I have all of them stuck in there, so I must have it. No, what they've done is they've pushed the key pins into the way. So what you end up doing, what you want to do is fill it through the pin stack if you're doing single pin picking for the key that's binding. The one that's pressing against the side of that cylinder's um, drilled out chamber and you try to feel for which one is binding. And the order you won't know, you just kind of have to play with it so you figure out which one's binding. And then figure out what next one's binding, and eventually, like, I think this front one's the one's binding right now. Because I just left off the tension a little bit, and hopefully I can get it to open. There's also raking. Raking, which I've alluded to a couple times, you take a tool, and instead of individually filling things out, you kind of just reach in, and you start pulling across the pins, and hoping for the best. And there are all sorts of locks where that will work. Usually ones that don't have a very aggressive keyway, and I can't put that on camera and actually hold it at the same time. That would be an example of raking. Uh, some people make a different distinction between raking and rocking. Like a Bogota is meant for rocking, some people will say. Uh, I'll, I'll consider both raking for the sake of... Uh, Justin, what do you think? Would you make a distinction between raking and rocking, or do you just call it all raking? It's all bad. It's all kind of raking. It's yeah. Well, Bogota, you might do some, uh, 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 some sort of rocking motion. Notice how I'm varying my angles to go in and out. And the idea is you're replicating all sorts of potential cuts in the key. And hopefully, via just pure brute force combinations, you might be able to eventually get a lock to pop. This particular one doesn't seem to be all that prone to using this type of rake. But I've seen other ones like um, some of these master locks that are pretty prone. This is a master lock number five. You want a good practice lock? I actually recommend the bass lock number five. It, um, it's a very chunky lock. If you want to learn single pin picking, it's usually easier to feel when you got things lined up the way you want. Uh, other locks sometimes they're really mushy and you can't quite feel that pin when it locks up above the shear line. So I highly recommend getting some of these for practice. Oh, and that reminded me. I was going to um, get a few of these off of here so you all could play. So um, 
This one with the goofy face, these are my angry locks. I, remember I mentioned they were progressives? We put a dumber and dumber looking face, the harder the lock, sorry, the easier the lock was, and the uglier and uglier face, the harder the lock is. That black one is five pins and one spool pin. It's still not hellaciously hard, but it's um, tougher than the green one. One exception to the rule I told you about very low tension, some of these, once you actually have it picked, you have to feel that it's moved ever so slightly, and then turn it the rest away. So I'm doing bottom the keyway tensioning on this one. <coughs> I'm just going to start raking them open because it's going to be faster than individually feeling them. And I like for raking a deforest offset, which is essentially what I got on my hand. This one's kind of more rounded off. This is one of the versions that Sparrows makes. Uh, the one from um, Southern Specialties, the Euro one, I like better for some things like a, oh, put my tongue, small TSA locks because it's very thin and you can get into locks you can't get into otherwise. But uh, yeah, I got uh, one, two, and three pin off of this. I'll make it some more off a little bit later. And um, if anybody wants to try to pick some of these things, we got pick tools here. And uh, first come, first serve, pass it on to someone else. Unfortunately, there's only so many to go around. Here's an illustration of what I was trying to talk about with a single pin picking. Basically, you're reaching in, you're feeling the pin stack, you're feeling for which pin is binding, and you apply a little more pressure, and then you might feel the tension to turn a little bit. You feel the cylinder turn a little bit. If you were talking about proper um, way of holding the tension tool, here's one of the things I like to do. I like to hold it as far out on the lever arm as I can. Notice how far my finger is out there. The advantage to that is I get more motion when it's in the cylinder actually moves. I get a better idea if it's actually moved. If I was in like this, I wouldn't feel it as much because of how that lever arm works. You get more motion out on the end. So that's my preferred uh, grip when I'm doing bottom of the keyway tensioning. Uh, but there's one tool, I always thought this was a useless tension tool. I finally found out how to tension properly this. This one's great for ones that have to hey, stop the keyway tension, but you don't want to lose your tool. You can hold it with your fingers like that, apply tension, and then individually reach in and see if you can pick the lock. As far as hand grips concerned, by the way, whatever is comfortable. Uh, I know SOB likes to hold his pencil style, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? This, this is basically how you hold yours, right? Unfortunately, I first got good at raking before I ever got any good at um, single pin picking. So I, I, I'm holding mine like this a lot because I'm doing raking like that. Um, I'm going to say Kyle's is probably a better way to learn it initially eh, as well as getting final control and a feel for the pins. But you see, what they're doing is just feeling through the lock, finding the pin stack that binds, and popping that up. And I just recall I left the tool with Trusted Sex um, Booth. Uh, can, can anybody run the Trusted Sex Booth for me? I had a big piece of metal, I had an under the door tool that was left at Trusted Sex Booth. I don't know what I did with it. I think I left it on a table. Oh, you brought it to me here? I'll use that one as an illustration. I have a better one at, at Trusted Sex, but okay. Thank you. That's something I'm going to demonstrate later on. Uh, things people can do to make a lock harder to pick is put special pins in it. If it's a pin type of lock, you put something like a spool pin in it or um, a serrated pin, it's going to be a lot tougher. This is a spool pin because it's shaped like a spool. And notice as it's lifted above that shear line, there's a spot right in the middle of it where it can hang. Um, this is another mushroom type pin. Uh, same basic principle. Serrated has multiples of these. Uh, some of those padlocks that you're passing around now that are colored, that have different numbers of pins in them, I actually had to go in and throw out the spool pins in them and the serrated pins in them because by default state, they're probably impossible, uh, well, close, they're hard to pick. They're really hard to pick. Uh, SOB, has anybody picked that purple one yet? That purple one I left with you, did they open that yet? 
No. Okay, didn't think so. That one has like two spools in it. All the pins in it are serrated except like one straight key pin. So it's a bear. But these little dips make that little extra spot on that shear line where it can get caught up and you can't lift it all the way and you can't open the lock. Now there's ways to defeat those by using very light tension and feeling when you push on a pin that it kind of applies pressure back on your tension wrench. And then, okay, I think that's a spool pin. And you, you feel that counter rotation here. Uh, or you feel like you see the counter rotation here. You gotta let off that tension, lift again, and then turn it. But generally you feel a couple spool pins in something, it's gonna be frustrating for anybody to pick. Or well, more frustrating. That brings up some common questions people have. Which way do I turn? It depends on the lock. If you are talking about... Oh, done that? Cool. Actually, I'm going to talk about spool pins just a little bit more now that I have this in my hand. This one has spool pins. If you take a very close look... I lift them up. Notice how they're shaped like little bitty spools. I have another one of these that is straight. If you lift this up, uh, I'm trying to get it right in, right area. Notice the pins are straight. This straight one is way, way easier. Because when you're trying to pick this thing, what ends up happening is you lock up that shear line in a spot you don't want to lock up on. Like, I'll press all, get them all the way up and like, get it to bind in the wrong spot. It just makes it tremendously harder to pick it. All right, which way do you turn a lock? It really depends on um, what it is and how it's hung. In the case of deadbolts, the rule is if the deadbolt is on your left, you turn clockwise. If it's on your right, you turn counterclockwise. Basically, you turn away from the bolt. <laughs> now, blue collar or laminated master locks, um, like the master lock number three and number five, which by the way, you can tell by just looking at the bottom, it'll usually have the number on it. It's the model number. Those will turn either way. Doesn't matter. And that's kind of nice from a standpoint of teaching because if it doesn't pick well one way, it might be easy to pick the opposite way. Mailbox locks, those are generally counterclockwise. Door knobs, are, that's, a, that's a crap shoot. You don't know until you try it. You may uh, pick it backwards and and then, after you do that, be able to pick it back forwards. Um, or there's something you can use called a plug spinner. Oh, thank you very much. You're my favorite assistant. A plug spinner is a fun little device that allows you to um, undo a lock that has been picked the wrong direction. Or I say, open a lock that's been picked the wrong direction. And I don't know if this demo is going to work. This thing, this little lock here, it was supposed to be turned clockwise to open it. But notice it was picked, or well, actually technically it was closed after being picked, but we won't split hairs. It's, it's easy to turn this thing in the counterclockwise direction because it's been unlocked that direction, but you can't keep going that way and actually open the lock via manipulating the cam or actuator. So what, what you can do is take it close to being back to the lock position and use a plug spinner. And the way a plug spinner works is it spins the plug so fast that the pins don't have a chance to fall. So I'm going to see if I can get that to work in here. So insert the plug spinner. I'm trying to get it in the right center. <laughs> And it felt like I got it, yeah. So basically it, it turns it so fast that the pins don't get a chance to fall. So you could pick it backwards and still open the lock. And now some locks are just easier to pick backwards. And oh, I'll hand that red one around if anybody wants to play with this one. This one's five pins, no spools. The black one I have on that chain is um, five pins, one spool. All right. Uh, Yes. <laughs> Imagine a real loop block in some ways might be easier to pick because you have more feel. Like if one particular chamber got all gunked up, it'd probably mess with your ability to feel when you actually got it above the shear line. 
The answer is yes, it would have an effect. What the exact effect would be, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, but knobs, you don't necessarily know which way it is. Um, when in doubt though, I'd say do clockwise. A lot of uh, padlocks I have are only clockwise. And I don't know if I've ever encountered a padlock that's only counterclockwise. I'm sure it exists, but I'm not sure. It's not as common. So we're in doubt clockwise. Now, this brings me to a different subtopic, and that is comb picking. Comb picking is fun. Essentially, the problem with comb picking is um, someone has created a lock that has too much room in the Bible of the lock. The Bible is where all the, th all the things uh, in the lock we treat to the springs, the key pins, the dryer pins. Now, in a well balanced lock, there ain't room for any these key pins to come up above the shear line. They're going to be stuck there. There won't be room for them to move that far. However, in a not so good lock, you still can. Thank you, man. They need to make bigger glasses for this place. All right. So, comb picking is basically lifting everything above the shear line. And I'm going to try to illustrate this with a comb pick. So, I'm going to lock this up. And I need to make sure I have the right one. Let me see. That's not the right one. That's the right one. And you go into the lock and you lift everything above the shear line. You gotta get a tine underneath each one of the pins. And that's sometimes easier said than done. I'm thinking about switching to my Chinese version of this because I think I've had better luck with it. But you see I, I got the, all the pins up above, but something is just in the wrong spot. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you lift everything above the shear line. Now, this is really too useful uh, in America on this lock because you're not going to see this lock in America pretty much. This is like a Chinese manufacturer's lock. However, there is one type of padlock in the United States you'll see a lot of. It's like a model of um, mass lock solid bodied, I think it's 140, that there's a comb pick for. I've ordered ones from China and cut them down. Like, I got this little Chinese one that come, came with, with five pins, and I cut it down to be fewer. But in that particular type of um, padlock, you can lift everything up into the Bible and open the lock. And I have an example of that here. And in a bit, I'm going to um, hand around a tool for people to try it themselves. Don't apply a lot of force. If you're trying to turn really hard, let's just say, if you get it in the right spot, you don't have to turn any harder than you'd have to do a key. So I reach into the lock. I, may, I feel for where I have a tine underneath each one of the pins. And I lift. <laughs> and that opens the lock. So if you want to try that, I want to demonstrate it again. But um, get this tool back to me eventually. But you all try that. I'm going to find a couple more of those style, style locks to open. Solid body black mask. Okay. I found him. Yeah, this is those 140s I mentioned. There's a bunch of other ones that are the exact same size. I've seen some of the master lock this works on. But you basically go in, you lift all of them evenly, and if you get it done right, you should be able to get it to turn. However, riding it all upright may not always be as easy as you'd hope. There we go. And the same thing goes for these. You probably see these in a lot of gym locker rooms. Well, I know what mass lock 140s are, and I can recognize them by sight because they're this size. They're exactly this size. You'd have to research it. Yeah, you'd have to research it. But this is a Brinks lock, and I'm going to call it right. This particular Brinks lock has the same issue. So I think you have to be a little bit hard, a little harder to line anything up on it. Yes. But usually I do that when I have an obstruction or something broken in it. There we go. 
It takes a little practice even to do this, but it's kind of fun. So is there a lock type of manufacturer you recommend? Um, Avis makes some good stuff. Abroad makes some good stuff. Master Lock and American Lock both make great stuff if you pay the money. That's the thing. Master Lock, like the Master Locks, those colored ones. Or like if you go to buy a good Master Lock, other than the highest price ones, I mean. Well, order online and ask people about spool pins. Does this model have spool pins or something like that in it? Other than that, if I'm in a hardware store, I look for one. I look for ones that um, have ball bends to the, to the padlock because you can't shim those. And I look for key cuts that are very random and different. And I, I'll give an example of those kind of key cuts in a bit. Yeah, that's a little overlifting. There's another type of attack called key impressioning. This is where you take a soft brass key, you put it in the lock, you wiggle it back and forth, and whatever pin is applying the most pressure gets the biggest little scratch. Then you file that down, then you do it again. Oh, it's here now. File it down, do it again, file it down, do it again. And eventually you get a key to that lock. I don't have the gear with me to, to uh, demonstrate that. A little bit about master keying. Master keying is a technique where you can have um, one key that opens up two different doors, but a different key that opens up just one of the doors. One of the ways they do that is with wafers. This is a, not the same kind of wafers as in a wafer lock, but it's still called a wafer. And there's two different heights at which this will open. So there's two different keys, and you can have two different doors locked with slightly different locks, but have one key open both, but a different key only open one. Having a whole lot of wafers, though, depending, can also make it easier to rake a lot because now there's different heights in which it will open up potentially. More combinations are possible to um, use to open it. There's also pin tumbler locks that are entirely different than. Um, well, not entirely different. The slip pin tumbler locks are just rearranged. This is a type of tubular lock. And I'll just give you an example. Right here is a transparent tubular lock. You'll notice it still has springs, drive pins, and key pins. It's just aligned differently. You put in the proper key, everything lines up with the shear line, and you can turn it. Now this one, I have a tubular pick. I have yet to be able to pick this transparent one, even with the tubular pick. So I'm going to try to illustrate on a different one. Uh, I thought I had it on this, yes. On this little keychain, I have a tubular lock. This one goes in a vending machine. If I want to try to pick it, what I do, what I have to do is a type of self-impressioning attack using a tool um, especially made for tubular locks, and that's this one. Right now, it's keyed to a different lock that's currently in this in this building. Uh, I'm going to, but that we did have permission to have. Uh, I'm going to undo this collar, take off the tension, and I got all these little needles that come out. I flatten those out, and I apply a little bit more tension on this so that the pins don't go in as easily. And you try to get it to self-impression. Whatever pin is currently binding should push up harder on that needle than ever pins. And eventually, you should hopefully be able to make it so well, if you press in right, all the pins line up correctly to make you a key for that lock. It may take a couple tries to actually get to work. I got to work last night, no problem, but um, let's see. But the idea is to wiggle it back and forth, and hopefully the needles that are hitting the binding pins will press up more, and you'll be able to eventually get the key for the lock. All right, we'll give this one more. Let's give it two more tries. Because it's really neat when it works. On some, it works like magic. One more, one more try.
Trust me, I have photographic evidence that it worked last night. <laughs> Okay, come on, tighten, tighten. Once you actually feel it move a little bit, and you know you got it, you tighten that down so it doesn't move anymore. And right now, I have something that moves in the lock. And if I wanted to, I have a depth gauge, if I can find it quickly. Let me see if I can find my depth gauge. Oh yeah, here it is. There's a depth gauge that this one came with, and you can use it to measure these different heights of the needles, and then have this key reproduced by number, by locksmith, or if you, yourself if you have the right equipment. So now I actually have key. I can keep this locked down and just keep using it as the key for that lock, or I can take the number and get the key reproduced. Mixed results of these, some are easier to get, uh, uh, pick with a tubular lock pick than others, but it does work. It's probably something I need to practice a little bit more on. Interesting story. Um, these tubular locks, or something that's also known as ACE locks, because of a company that used to manufacture them. Um, a while back in the late 90s, the kryptonite bike lock, they ordered a bad batch of these. Um, somebody decided to go with a cheaper component, and these particular tubular locks were so bad, you could take a big pen cap, push it into the lock, wiggle it, and make a, do a self-impressioning attack, and essentially open the lock with that. Uh, supposedly, we fixed it since then, and older versions of the krypton weren't prone to that, but for a certain range period, you could do that. Uh, Skylar Town's actually apparently doing research to figure out who was the person who made the order for those um, bad tubular locks. Another type of pin tumbler lock is a dimple lock. And um, I have a better dimple lock example in one of my pictorial computers. Uh, the only real example I have here right now to show you is, hmm, I thought I had it with me. Ah, here we go. Notice where the pins are. They're on the side of the lock. Or so it's say the side of the key that goes in the lock is where you have the cuts. And you open this one like that. The only way I've found to easily pick this one, the pins itself are not particularly difficult, but you have to tension it weird. Because any kind of tension tool you put in there, you scrape along that edge, you scrape along the outer cylinder, and you can't pick it right. Now, if you take a, make a hook out of a paper clip, put it there, and like pull on it with your finger, that's about the best thing. Well, actually, I think I actually have one. If you do something like um, that, something like that, and pull on it, and use like a half diamond to manipulate the pins. I've had some luck with that. Oh, uh, actually, what I'm thinking about, uh, let me show you some of the uh, locks that Johnny Long uh, had belt bring back. I'm not sure who actually bought them, uh, but they were at, at the market, and I think it was oh, it was in Uganda. I don't remember the exact name of the town, but um, it came back with some really cool looking ones. Ah, this one has the same keyway that you just saw. So we'll set that one aside. This one is a type of, well, I believe it is a type of lever lock. Now, you remember those old school locks your grandma probably had on her door where it's like, it looked like the classic keyway shape? Those were most, most likely lever locks. And there's a bunch of levers you have to rotate to the right, uh, raise to the right angle to be able to open it. Here's the key for this one. Opens it. Close it. Um, this one's kind of interesting. It's got a cross shape in it. There's some uh, uh, crucifix form locks. They'll have pins on this side, this side, this side, this side. 
Um, this one does not. For some reason, it's a fake out. I actually looked down at it and felt it. It's only got pins on one side, so I'm not sure what the idea of the cross was. On the subject of cruciform locks, though, I've actually seen a lock that I don't have any idea why, why this was a good marketing decision, necessarily. Um, and I, I think it was an Indian manufacturer lock, and the symbol means something different to, to them. You know, it's a, it's a religious symbol in many different cultures. But they had a lock, they had a keyway similar to this, but it was actually shaped like a, a swastika. Yeah, they made one version of that lock, and then the next version, it was slightly more curved on the handle, on the arms. But there's a lot of people... I thought people wanted to collect that lock just for the sake of the rarity of it, because it didn't last very long. Um, was that... No, war? Well, actually, well, it, yeah, it would be. And let me see what else we got here. Oh, this is another lever lock. And uses what that classic key uh, you're familiar with from uh, looking through keyholes. And this one I think is the coolest one they brought back. This has this weird key that looks like um, this. And I've seen some cars that have this kind of uh, keyway, a key siding like that, but I'm not sure what it's called. I need to figure that out. Actually, is the Sabi around or Justin? Justin! You ever see a keyway like that? Besides, you've seen it in cars. Is there a name for it? I've seen the same key type of keyway in cars. But what's it called? Build key. Yeah. Okay. This is the lock it goes with. And that's a pretty lock. Oh, yeah, these are just African locks. Yeah, milled key. Actually, I will show yours on camera because that <laughs> Someone to steal Justin's car. That'd be like the worst crime ever. Like stealing my car. But, actually, we're going to take a look. At, oh, actually, I'm going to hand these off to you to take a look at it if you want to take a look at these, man. Ooh, yeah. those are pretty. Um, oh, right, those, and uh, let me hand you the keys for them, too. And I'll let you take them off your table. If you want to pick them, fine. Only let experienced people pick them for the time being, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh here's one more. And these, you know. His hands are full. His lock went over. Anyway, this is a type of a dimple key that you might see on a vending machine where essentially it's still a pin tumbler, but the uh, bidding is on the side of the key. There's, a little, there's other types of locks though, like uh, this detainer locks. And some of these have a tendency to be very high security. They're essentially like a combination lock, but instead of dialing the combination, a key will put all the rotations in for you. And the way they work is all these different disks have to be aligned just right for a sidebar to fall the way, and then the entire lock can turn. I have some of these, um, and I have been able to successfully sort of pick them. It's almost closer to raking, except you're not really raking. Uh, but I don't think I have the ability to show that in an expedient amount of time. Let me see if I can find them in here. I took way too many easy locks away for the class. I'm going to hand these back out. Um, let's see. I'll keep that one here, that one here. Put some here. Put some here. Ah. Well, this mass lot North should be pretty easy to practice on. Okay. I have a disc detainer lock in here someplace or another that I like to demo. At one time I had one that was a cutaway. However, my cutaway seems to be missing in action. Huh. Okay, I'm not seeing it. Alright, here's an example of a disc detainer lock and the key for it looks a little something like this. Except that's not the right one for this particular disc detainer lock. And you'll notice there's all sorts of little cuts in it that have different angles. When those angles all align right, and if it's the right key, you should be able to open the lock. I don't think this is the correct key for this one. 
And someplace or another, I actually have one that has the sides milled out, and you can see the ball bearings in it. But I don't know what happened to that particular one. I'm going to spend just a short time more trying to find that lock, because it's really cool for demoing this on. Huh. I thought I collected everything I needed on this chain. Uh, you might have to ask me about it later on. But, anyway, that's a very simple this detainer lock. You notice you don't see anything down it. You might even look at it and say, that, feels, that looks like a warded lock. This one's not. I mentioned um, wafer locks before. One way you can tell someone's a wafer lock, if you see flat pieces lay coming down, it's probably a wafer lock. If you see smoother, rounded pieces, it's a pin and tumbler lock. So you can kind of like look down the keyway to tell what kind of lock it is. That brings me to another subject, bumping and bypass. There's other ways of getting to a lock besides just normal picking or raking. Some have, well, other techniques. The principle of bumping is kind of like um, a billiards or a, a Newton's cradle, where you pull back a ball and you get bounce, 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 bounce. The idea is you put a key in that has been cut down to the lowest depths on all the key positions, all the points, and you pull it back one notch, you slam it in, it hits all of the pin stacks, drives the key pin and drive pin up above the shear line, the key pin falls down first, and for a brief time, you can hopefully turn the lock. Um, I have an example for that, and that's this lock right here. I chose this one because this is the one I've been able to most reliably bump. So, uh, here's a series of bump keys. I have some ones I have for Schlage locks, for um, uh, quick sets, and uh, also master. I think master lock M1, I think that's the standard keyway. So, what I'm going to do is <clears throat> put this in the lock and pull it back one notch. Some people will lock bump just like this, and that's all they'll do. <clears throat> Me, I want to be a hand model when I grow up, so I don't want to bash my fingers up too badly. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a tension tool. That gets my fingers out of the way, and I'm less afraid to hit them, because being afraid to hit your fingers screws up your bump. Um, also, I'm going to try not to hit my cord there. Open. And I'm going to do that. Instead of doing it in the camera there, I'll just do it out here. Put it all the way in. Pull it out one notch. Apply a lightest bit of tension. And occasionally mess it up. I had the pins. There's a lot of locks that's successful on. There's other locks you'll be seeing that bump and bump, 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 and you'll never actually get it open. Um, let me, yeah, grab a tension tool like this. Anybody wants to try it? And uh, Bob, I'll leave it out here around the tables, and you all can try it a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, hammer. <laughs> Don't want to walk off that. But that's simple lock bumping. Now, you can do this in a more automated fashion, though. Here I have a type of electronic bump gun. What it does is vibrates a needle really fast and allows you to bump a lock, essentially, in a, well, much easier way. Now I'm trying to find the tension tool I had with this, and apparently, I mislaid it. Alright, I gotta find me a tension tool before I can actually demo this, so I'm gonna walk over to this table and uh, see what I can find. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if anybody needs a need tension tool, I have a little bag of tension tools over there. So, I'm gonna demo this, I guess in front of the camera right here. Let me lock this back. You find yourself a good spot in the keyway, you take the electric pick, and it vibrates those pins really fast, and you're able to turn the lock. The strange I can't turn it back right now. There we go. This is not exactly completely surreptitious entry since it is noisy. 
Uh, they don't serve the electric one. They sell uh, one that um, you pull a trigger and it bounces a little pin. Um, I have one like that, not from Sparrows, from some other company. I can't get it to work real well. Sparrows version might be better. Um, actually, I don't know. I'm not thinking about it. I think Sparrows may be selling some of these. Sparrows sells these now, don't they? Yeah, the kilometers. I think I would mine straight from China. Yeah. I'm not gonna hand this one out to play with though right now because it'd be noisy. But it, it works. More than three hours after the con's begun and I haven't released a single video, I feel weird. <laughs> Alright, does that bumping I was mentioning Let's go on to the next? The shimming a lock. Some locks have a lot of space around the um, shackle, and if there's ones that are spring loaded you, and the shackles uh, tongue and groove system is spring loaded, you can sometimes push those aside. Now, it's ball bearings, there's no place for the ball bearings to go. That's why I wish I had that one hollowed out lock with the ball bearings I can show you. But let me see if I can find a good lock to um, shim. People sometimes make shims out of tin cans and whatnot. I'm going to use some professional butterfly shims. I've also made these things successfully out of uh, some types of plastic. The idea is we take our shims like this and there's these little locking dogs inside of the lock. Or at least this type of lock. So, if we can go in around the shackle and push these out of the way, we can get in real easy. So, all right, notice this locking crawl right there. Notice how I'm pulling it aside. Basically, we'll be doing that by pushing something in around the shackle. So, let me find the lock that's good for that. You can do this with a lot of mass lock number fives also, but, um, this one from the Harbor Freight is just way easier to demo it. I put a butterfly shim in like that on one side. I put a butterfly shim in like this on the other side. By the way, you don't want, really, really don't want to step on these things in the middle of the night. You turn them into the center, and you pop the lock open. Because what you're doing is you're pushing that little tongue out of the way. Oh, okay. thanks. Yeah, those things are pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, so I put them in like that. Turn. Turn. Pop. And I'll, I'll put this over on this table if y'all want to try it. Just take the shims out after you pick it, or uh, open it, and... You can cut those out of tin cans, but I don't like doing that in classes because I'm afraid people are going to be bleeding all over the place. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I'm not, I'm, oh, I'm not in frame at all, am I? Has my chair been moving over? You're in frame of mind. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't explain how that system works. No. Come around here. It's only getting many on the left hand side. Ah, okay. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah, boys, that's better. Thank you. Most things, luckily, I've shown in front of this camera as opposed to the corner camera. That's good. Thank you, man. I, and I, can, I, I should have looked at the screen earlier. I can hardly see it, that, that screen at this angle. Um, yes. Oh, how's it going? What's up, Mr. Bo? Alright, next subject matter, loading. Loading got its name from celluloiding. There's some types of um, locks where the shot, where the, uh, you have a latching system that's easy to push aside. And I have to go grab one of my other lock walls to easily demonstrate this. So, let me move some stuff out of the way and go grab something I can loid. <laughs> Okay. I'm 
I'm going to put this, I guess, um, around on me temporarily. Here you have a little latching system. Little latching system there. Let me unlock it. Where when the door closes, it should close and well, actually, let me spin this around. Because I gotta be able to see it, you all gotta be able to see it. And now you can see how good my dental hygiene is. Alright, let's see if we can get some distance here. So, a properly hung latch like this, this little button right here would be pressed in. If that button's pressed in, the latch will not retreat. A lot of people don't hang them right, right, and these buttons aren't depressed enough. And what ends up happening is you can open the lock using uh, something like a credit card. Uh, Sparrows makes a little tool, especially for this, called a hall pass, which I should have one in my wallet at pretty much all times. And if it isn't hung right, you can press it and press right through and open the door. We put it back into place. Lock it again. You can also do that from the other side by pulling. And I didn't, it went through, but I didn't pull on the doorknob at the right time. And getting this on camera at the same time as doing it. There you go. Open it. And I can do that because this one isn't properly hung. This one at the top is more a more properly hung uh, self-latching system. That little button is depressed enough to where I can't reach in and get into it. And I also have some uh, plating there so I can't directly get to the latch. However, even if that plating was there, if it was badly hung, I could still potentially get to it. They make these little mica sheets. Uh, in the Chinese companies you order from it, they call them nanomeat sheets or something like that. Anyway, they're very tough pieces of plastic, very flexible, that you can go in around things like molding and still be able to open it. But you can get into a lot of doors via that way. Let me put my... Put this thing back together. Yeah, you can do that too. I made it basically just for illustrating um, loading and such. Yeah, there's that little button I was mentioning that you got to make sure gets depressed. <coughs> By the way, um, there's a similar thing on all of your hotel room doors also to keep you from doing just this. There's an extra little thing that gets depressed. If it's not properly set, you can't retract the door latch. Um, at least it should be. At least on most of the hotel doors I look at. There's also things like shivs. Shivs are a way of bypassing locking, locking crawls by pulling them aside. Um, to give you an illustration of that, I'm going to use um, some things from Sparrows. These are... Oh, they call them the master switch. That's their name for them. Uh, Silver Bullet is a, a product that Peterson sells, which does much the same thing. All right, let's see if we can illustrate this. Looking for the right lock. There we go. Remember how I uh, demonstrated that locking crawl, that spring-loaded one? And see how I can pull it aside? That's essentially what you're doing with tools like this. Now, these particular ones were designed by, either, or else, I'm not sure who the original person is, uh, both Peterson and Sparrows make some. And they work on master lock number threes in the following way. I hope we should have, um, anybody see a black laminated master lock number three? Uh, no, uh, it, it was, uh, free on the bottom. Yeah. Normally they have blue collars, but this one doesn't have a blue collar. It's like a. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah.
Yes, yes, thank you. That'll do. Yeah, the idea behind these is you can reach into them and open them by, by manipulating the locking claws. This one tool goes in one way at the top, another tool goes in the other side. And you gotta find just the right holes that kind of fall into in the lock. And when you do, you can hopefully pop the lock open. There we go. And basically you're manipulating the locking crawls. But these work on more than just, or different versions of this works on more than just master locks. For instance, um, these black brinks. Most brinks are a little bit harder to pick than a master lock, but these ones have an issue where you can um, reach into the lock and you have to manipulate the locking dog with like the same tool in two different places and pops open. Um, I've seen ones though where it's even easier than that. Let's see. Pops open. So there's bypasses like that. <clears throat> there's also things like um oh yeah. Bypass drivers. Uh, there's a type of um well, the sale types of lock from American uh, lock manufacturer, who's now owned by MassLock to my knowledge, uh, that are actually very good locks, very hard to pick, but they have a flaw in how everything connects in the back end. If you look inside this lock, you'll notice there's um, a spot where, where uh, a cylinder is going to lock into it. And when it turns, be able to turn everything, move the actuator, and let the ball bearings fall out of the way. So, and I'm, this would be an example. Now, uh, this is a master cylinder. On American, it's lined up in such a way that the spot you need to touch and the keyway are essentially in line with each other. And what you can do is you can reach a tool in, and instead of actually having to turn the cylinder, you touch that little touch point in the back and turn it and be able to actually open the lock. So to give you an illustration, um, this particular American is really hard to pick. But buddy, Doug gave this one to me. And while it's hard to pick, because it doesn't have uh, any protection for me getting to the back and manipulating the back of the lock, I can reach a tool into it. It looks like a little golf club, kind of. All the way to the back, get it in there, wiggle it, and open the lock. This is a fairly standard issued uh, padlock in the US military in the 90s. I'm pretty sure they still use other stuff from American. They've, they've improved this lock since. There's actually a wafer you can put in it that will um, help protect it, and I'm trying to find my wafer. Unfortunately, my keying kit, I kind of uh, dumped it all sideways, and now everything is messed up in it. Let's see what we got. Anyway, they put an extra little wafer in there to keep you from reaching to the back of the lock of the tool and being able to simply open it. Then a company put out a wafer breaker to break that wafer so you could still use the original tool to reach to the back of the lock and open it. All security is an arms race of one sort or another. Okay, I was going to show you all the wafer, but the wafer has um, disappeared someplace into this messy kit of mine. There's also things like under the door uh, tools. A lot of doors for ADA compliance have to be easily um, opened by people who with disabilities. And uh, you, for fire code reasons, you have to have doors that can be gotten through if someone's inside and they got to get out. So you can't lock someone in the building. Under the door tools work by the principle of you reach under the door, and let's say the lever style knob is easily accessible, it's like parallel to what you're seeing in front of you, you can get down the floor, reach a tool like this through, up the other side, then pull on this and pull down the lever arm. Um, you kind of get the idea? It's a real simple tool, but it's pretty effective. Although the um, 
handles around here have been really smooth. Not that I've actually tried here. I'm just saying, really smooth handles make the problems. I think I'm, that this is one from Sparrows Made. Uh, I also have one that was homemade. Uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking about adding some rubber or something to the top to make it a little more tacky for those sort of doll knobs. Was that? Oh, we'll talk later. Um, uh, a lot of people want to know about handcuffs. There's different ways into handcuffs. Generally, I don't recommend using lockpicks on handcuffs. If you have lockpicks with you, then in all likelihood you're in a situation where you could also be carrying a handcuff key. There's not much point to it. Now, picking with improvised items, that makes some sense to me. But I'll show you a little bit about how uh, handcuffs work. That seems to be something people have an interest in. That is assuming I can actually find my... Oh, handcuff. Yeah. Right here, we have... A single handcuff. You'll notice that there's a ratcheting system that allows the lock. Oh, sorry, that well, is a type of lock, so it allows the handcuff to keep getting tighter and tighter and tighter. If a cop is arresting you, hopefully you're using the double locking system. With the double locking system, they press this little button on the back. Um, Smith and Wesson's actually have something like you flip right here instead. They get this pressed in. I'm gonna use a different tool for that. I use an actual handcuff. They press that in and this ball comes down. And that keeps this ratcheting system from getting tighter and tighter. And you don't want it to get tighter and tighter because, well, the suspect may eventually lose circulation and it might be a, a lawsuit issue. Also, if they don't do that, it becomes much easier to, for the suspect to get out of the, out of the handcuffs. To unlock it, I have to get those bottom balls out of the way and then turn the other way and be able to put up the ratcheting system. Now, if um, someone wanted to get into one of these, if they did double lock it, <coughs> the way to do that is to find some kind of improvised, uh, very thin piece of metal around and use it to shim the lock. And I have something that should be good for shimming on my keychain because it's purposely made for that. Now, why you purposely make something to shim, uh, but not just carry the handcuff key around, I'm not quite sure, because the handcuff keys are fairly standardized. But the way these work is, you get in there, and maybe make it a little bit tighter, get that in between the teeth, and open it. However, if they double locked it, you wouldn't be able to do that. If they double lock it, that ball at the bottom makes it so there's nowhere for the ratcheting system to go. In that case, you have to put something in there to move those bottom balls out of the way and then uh, either shim it or... I've seen people do this. I've seen people be able to take handcuffs, bash on something hard like this, and then make that ratcheting system go out of the way because of uh, momentum. I have yet to have a whole lot of success with that. Let me see if I can have any tools here that would uh, be good for this one. So to actually get into this, someone would have to get in there with a small item. Sometimes you can use a paper clip. I'm actually using a bow guitar, which, is, as I said before, isn't realistic. Push those balls aside before they can even attempt to shim it. But if they have something to press those balls aside, they can probably use that to directly manipulate ah, the ratcheting system as well. Trying to get that little spot. See, this is the reason I don't recommend using lock picks for this, because it's not realistic and you're also going to bend them, like I just did. So let me put that back in place, and uh, yeah, you have to get both of those out of the way, and then you might be able to, to either shim it or push the ratcheting system out of the way. Yeah, this one doesn't particularly respond well to being hit like that. <laughs> Who does? Like I said, I just carry handcuff keys with me. If I want some mess with handcuffs, I think I have some out there on the table someplace, though. <laughs> Finally, there's a little bit about repinning. Were you repinning a lock? Well, there's seven, seven types of locks you can uh, repin, but uh, I'm going to show you one from Quickset that's nice and convenient. Here's a Quickset uh, using the smart key system, and you key it this simply. You find the key you want it to be, and you find the key that it currently uses. 
This is the key it currently uses. Oh, I don't have it in lock. It's stuck in the frame. Alright, this is the key it currently uses. And I tilt up. I open it up. It's currently stuck in there until I use a tool to be able to remove it. Use this tool right here. Able to remove this key. Whatever you do, don't slam it shut right now. Because if you do, it won't be keyed for any key. I, we tried that, I figured well, what's going to happen, and then we just couldn't get into it. I've yet to be able to pick one. I'm sure someone maybe can, but um, all right, now I'm going to put in a different key, close it back, and now it's this new key. I don't actually want it to be that key. I want it to be the original key, so I'm going to go back in one more time and reverse that process. So, which is kind of hard to do when it's that. Okay, let me use this instead. Maybe I can um, use something other than the official tool to get in there. Well, well the hands are all different. Well, this one's different. It's um, it's it's got these like. Uh, and this one, I've seen diagrams of it, but I don't know how to explain it. It's like you um, you get the sidebar to fall the way by using the special tool after it's already been unlocked. Then there's just like these uh, little shelves, and you, the new key you put in aligns those shelves to different levels, which represent your new pinning, and then you slam it shut again, the sidebar has a piece that fits in there to those individual shelves, and that's your new key. And that's a terrible explanation. I'd really need a diagram to be able to... Uh, not that anybody I've seen has done, no. Because you can't rekey it until you actually open it. You can't rekey it until you actually open it. Yeah. If, if this thing was, um, well, for instance, it's currently locked. Doing that doesn't get me anywhere. Not until it's been unlocked once can I really use that facility. Yeah. So I'm going to rekey this back to the key I have on my keychain. Put the key I want it to be in, walk it back. So that becomes a new key. Now, classic repinning is a little bit harder. What you do is, um, I'm hopefully one of these is using a, uh, using just a screwdriver. I'm gonna repin. I offensive. Right, let's say I wanted to repin this master lock. What you can do is get the cylinder to come out by unlocking it. Door locks are a little different, but those are gonna be keyed too. Get a screwdriver. All right. Uh, does anybody have a screwdriver? That's not the part of it is gonna be long enough. Anybody else with multi tool screwdriver? No, not really. I gotta get down deep into there to undo that screw. That's good. Thank you. All right, let me unscrew this. Ah, uh, no, it's not. Just a little too big right there. All right, well, he shows that. Oh, I'm going to show you something else um, about some locks that you can easily bypass because you just don't mess with the locking system directly. Um, I'm trying to find... <clears throat> Here it is. You've probably seen things like this on uh, display shelves, or like those big dis glass uh, display cabinets. You can get past these really easy because there's a ratcheting system, much like the handcuffs, and you can press against that ratcheting system, and instead of picking, slide it off that way. Okay.
Okay, since I can't easily get into this to repin it as of right now because I don't have the screwdriver, I'll show you what would have happened. The entire thing would have came out, and I'd essentially have... plug something like this or the rest of the whole cylinder the locking mechanism that I could put back in it and if I wanted to rekey that I would probably be pushing a C clamp off of here that normally holds this together and um, then I'd pull out the entire plug and let's see if I have the right key for this uh, plug that's not gonna be the right one it's sorry. What's up? Can you give me the key? Thank you. See, I hope this is the right key for this one. Yes, it is. So, for the CTF challenge, if you can quickly reproduce the key. This is the one you want to reproduce. Um, if I want to rekey this, I put the proper key in, turn it around, and you see the pins right there. I'd be able to dump these all out. I try to do it gently so I don't actually lose them. I'd take this key out, put in a new key. Sometimes easier said than done. Alright, I'm gonna have to find me a half diamond to be able to press these all back into place. In the process of rekeying, it can be uh, fairly easy for you to screw up and uh, get the cylinder in a state where you have to do a lot of work to make it functional again. There we go. You put in the key that you want it to be, close it, find the pins that would make that key work, making sure it's all nice and level to where it needs to be. Usually I use tweezers for this. Make sure it's all nice and level. Make sure it still turns. Then you can put your C-clamp back on, put it all back in the lock. Now in the case you have to replace the top pins, replacing the bottom pins on this is easy. Uh, if you have to replace the top pins, it becomes a lot more difficult. You have to use something called a plug follower. A plug follower is about the same size as the inner diameter of the cylinder. And it keeps those um, pins and keep, oh, sorry, it keeps uh, the top pins, the uh, driver pins, and the springs from falling back in. Yeah, this thing is uh, painful. Okay. Try to put that in. Maybe turn a little bit. And hopefully if you do it right, you can push this thing through. It keeps the driver pins and the springs from falling in. Then you might pull it out and then it would replace individual um, springs and driver pins as you desire. I'm not going to pull it all the way out because sometimes it's a pain to put back together. But that would be how you'd rekey one of these uh, either master locks like this or that American locks that I have over there at Kyle's area. Oh, and that's my repinning kit where it was nicely ordered. I found out the top of it isn't completely sealed, so the chambers aren't separate, and I tumped it over. And so now what used to look like that. Ah, wrong way. Wait, what was my. Yeah, it now looks like this. Oh, it looks like money. It looks very, very messy. Anyway, let me get the cash back in.
trying to find PowerPoint. There we go. Well, that pretty much concludes most of what I have for the class. If you want more information on lock picking, check out the lock wiki. Tons of details there. Uh, Bloomington Fools, Bossman's group, has their own web resources. Uh, Skylar Town does a lot of research on locks. You can check his stuff out. Lock picking 101 is a great forum system for learning about locks. We'll get to questions in a second. Uh, Reddit. Yes. Uh, Reddit.com. They have a lock picking subreddit. Uh, Tool US, you can find a lot of laws and other information. And if you want to see the various talks that have been recorded by me, by other people, uh, do a Google search for a site, iongeek.com, lock picking. Uh, big invite to Derbycom, but we always sell out all our tickets, and I think a lot of people already know about it. And um, finally, are there any questions? What's that? Milled. That's what Justin referred to him as milled. I don't know how to compromise that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't really played with those. I guess this is the first one I've actually had. It's called milled. Milled. Yeah, milled out. Thank you. No problem. Um. I didn't lock myself out of it, but we were having to get into uh, AV equipment while I was the place I was recording, and um, the AV techs were there watching me, but I would pick the locks on the AV cabinets to get into them. Also, for work, I've done things like you know, pick locks on um, shred bins and things. Actually, can I have you multi-tool again? I need it for something entirely different than the uh, screwdriver this time. Any other questions? Thank you for your time. Sorry we kind of the late start. And to the home audience, sorry I'm off the screen for most of the time, but trust me, the locks are far prettier than I am. Have a good day.